Welcome to Cotton Camp to Copenhagen. Um, I'm really glad to see all of you. I'm a little bit worried always speaking at CottonConf since that's our premier conference, gathering all the cotton enthusiasts here. I'm really glad you'll come from different parts of the world to talk about Kotlin, this uh, two-day packed program. So, so I'm talking about curtains today. So who of you already using Kotlin curtains in production? Please raise your hand. Oh, great, great, good crowd. Not all of you, though, like about a half. So for other half who, who don't, let's just quick recap on what coroutines are and uh, why we brought them to Kotlin, what they do for us. The coroutines um, save us from cobble hell. So when we program a synchronous code, we used to uh, have to wrap all our logic into callbacks, callbacks, callbacks. But with coroutines, we don't have to do this anymore. We, oops, oops, oh my god. What happens with my clicker? Oh my god, this is, I spoil. <laughs> no, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, we'll fix it. Here it is. Yeah, works fine. No, that was too fast for you to notice. Don't, don't kid me. You didn't say anything. Just pretend, pretend it did not happen. <laughs> so, and with curtains, uh, we program in direct style. You see, uh, we just program the logic the way uh, we regularly write it. And with curtains, uh, you know, we still have a synchrony. Um, our code can suspend, uh, wait for something, uh, network response, some event, but the logic itself is laid out in a sequential way. So it's asynchronous, yet sequential. You know, it's step by step. We do one thing, then we move uh, to another thing, then we move to another. So the logic is easy uh, to reason about in our code, uh, because it's, it's my clicker doesn't seem to work normally, which is fine. I should have taken the clicker that offered to me. Uh, so it's sequential. and. Uh, you see, with coroutines, we have these suspending functions, and we can use them uh, to say that our function returns a response. Uh, so we will wait for server, and uh, over time, we'll get a response. Or, you know, instead of one response, we have many responses. We can return a list of things. Oops. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Do you hear me? OK, good. Uh, well, we can return a list of responses uh, from a suspending function, uh, which is the way to work with many responses, lists, you know, collections of stuff, stuff like that. So let's take a close look at how this works. Uh, for example, one implementation of the list returning function can use a hypothetical function like build list. We don't have this in Kotlin standard library yet, but we'll uh, hopefully bring it uh, soon to standard library. And hypothetically, it could be doing some computation. It can be computing like three things and then returning a list of results. That's something like that could happen in your application. And from the main function, how would you use it? Uh, you know, you call foo, you get a list, then you iterate over a list, and, for example, you print results or process them and do something else with it. Uh, so let's take a close look at how it really, really works. And I tried to use my clicker again. Hopefully, it works this time. No, it doesn't. Oh, it works. So I just need, I just need to stay closer. Probably lots of insurance here. So how it works. I call foo. You know, execution goes to foo. Foo computes a value A and adds it to a list. It computes B, adds it to a list. Computes C, adds it to a list. Then the list gets returned. Then the execution goes back to main function. And the main function just was, was waiting all this time uh, for the results. And then it would go iterate over a list to print it. So easy, like normal sequential execution. Uh, so the problem with that is, you see, if computing those values takes a lot of time, we could have started processing them as soon as they're available. But using lists, we have to wait until the whole list of elements is ready, and then we start working on this. This kind of inefficient. This adds unnecessary delay in the data processing pipelines, especially if like, really taking uh, reading stuff from this or taking from network tapes time. You know, we could do better. We could start working on stuff before, uh, as soon as it's ready. But how we actually do it? One way to do it that we always had 
or not always, but uh, for a few years when we release coroutines, are channels. And channels are these pipes, conceptually, that you send your items on one side and receive on the other. What we can do with channels is we can change our code to using channels. Instead of building a list, we would produce a channel. And instead of adding to a list, we would send results to a channel. On the receiving code, on the other side of the code, we still call our function foo, but this gives us not a list, but it gives us a channel. We would iterate just as we iterated over a list. We would iterate over a channel, and then we process the elements. What difference it makes? It makes it a big, big difference, actually. If we take a look at how this code executes, then we see that main function calls foo to get a channel. It returns quickly, giving a channel back uh, to the caller. Now, caller has a channel, but foo is now working, producing the data. So we now have two coroutines working at the same time. One is going to produce the data, the other is consuming the data. So now, when we start receiving the data, and the first one in the foo starts computing the data, it computes the value and sends it, and it gets printed as soon as it was sent. Now it computes the other value and sends it, and it gets printed as soon as it was sent. It computes the third one and sends it, and the third one gets printed. So now we don't have to wait all three of them to be computed. Now, the foo completes, basically returns from its lambda. There's no more, no more values. So the for loop terminates, and we're done. So essentially, the code stayed the same. It's very similar to the code we had with lists. But now we can process our data as soon as the data is available, which is better. But there is one problem with channels. Channels are hot. What is that and why is that a problem? Let's do simple modification to our code. Let's just comment out the piece of code that's actually receiving the data from the channel. I mean, it's not, it could be a mistake, or you could have uh, an exception somewhere between you calling foo or and starting receiving data, or maybe you checked some other condition and returned and you don't have this code to receive from the channel anymore. What's going to happen if we run this code is that, as before, you know, we get a reference to a channel, we have two coroutines working, but the problem now is that, is that producing coroutine tries to send the value, but there is no other coroutine on the other end that would wait for it. So this, the whole thing just sits there working, doing nothing. And they actually, the, the code, if we ran it, just hangs. And it's, it's a real problem in practice. It's like channels are like you know, open files, or open network connections. They're hot. If I open the file, I have to read from it, or I have to close it if I'm not reading from it. The same if I open network connection. You know, I have to be communicating with the other side, or because if the other side expects me to send something, I, I have to send the corresponding values to the other side. I mean. It's, it's OK, we do have in our software some hot entities that we have to work with, but they're not that convenient toward this. And rather, you know, if we start using them all over the place, they become a source of hard to trade bugs. Like we forgot to close it, forgot to receive, and you know, this code becomes hard to debug. So we can do better. And this, the, but this actually, the reason with, uh, that the channel is hot is, is kind of type, our type system helps you. So if you look at the signature of the foo that was returning a channel, it, uh, it has this coroutine scope be before foo. So foo is extension coroutine scope. That's our uh, convention to say that uh, foo is returning a hot entity. It starts a coroutine that's working there. Be careful about it. But the fact that we are kind of type system helping you that we have this extension to indicate that this is a hot function doesn't really help a lot. You know, it's still error prone to work with hot entities. And that's a big reason why we created Kotlin Flow. So Kotlin Flow is this new addition to Coroutines library that we just stabilized recently, a few months ago, released it in a stable form. And the whole reason is to avoid this problem 
with hot channels and bring lots of other features that we'll talk about today. So let's see what flow is and how working with flow is different from both lists and channels. To use flow, there's not that many changes we have to do in our code. First of all, we change the signature of function. Instead of return channel list, we now return a flow. We use a flow builder to create it, not building list, not producing channel, but defining a flow. Inside the flow, we emit values. That's the verb we use to say that values are being sent or produced in a flow. And on receiving side, it looks very much similar. We call foo, we get a flow. But instead of a loop, uh, we call a special function called collect. So where flow is being collected uh, to process all the elements that the flow sends. So what happens if we run this code? Let's see how it works. Main calling foo. And just like it was with the channels, uh, foo returns quickly and gets back a flow. The difference, though, we don't have any coroutine active here. So at this point of time, main has a reference to flow, but it's not doing anything just yet. Now, when we start collecting a flow, then that's where the code in the flow activates and start emitting values, sending them to a collector. Now, collector prints those values, and returns back to foo, which emits next value, then it gets processed, this code prints them, you know, next value emitted, and it goes on until foo says, okay, I'm done, no, 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 nothing more to emit, then collection completes. Very similar, I'm emitting my data, receiving them as soon as they're available. The big difference here is that unlike channels, flows are called. It means that if I don't collect my flow, I've checked some other condition and I don't need the value, or something gone wrong in my code, some exception is thrown, the, nothing bad happens. You know, flow did not activate, there's no leaking resources, no leftover channel, nothing hangs. My code works normally when I uh, work with called entities like flows. The other big difference is flow is actually declarative. It leads us to more declarative style of programming. So let's take a look. That's our original code. And it's not a thing that runs when we call foo. It's a declaration of what's going to happen when foo collects. We can actually refactor it a bit. Instead of uh, calling compute three times, let's start with the flow of strings. A, B, C, that's the string, three strings that we want to compute on. And then let's take those strings and then use map operator to compute the results. So now we see, we're now using operators. So instead of doing repetitive code that we had before, we can define our execution pipeline using operators. And we can go further, because emitting th three strings is kind of a standard thing. We can use flow off, which is you know, ready-to-use builder that just gives us a flow of three items. Easy. That's not much different with how collections work. So if you've ever worked with collections in Kotlin, shouldn't be hard to, you, to get flows. You see types different, list their flow there, four characters for list, four characters for flow, the same amount of typing, you know. Uh, the difference is that for list, though, the function that returns a list is marked with suspend. Why so? Because, you know, when I call foo, I compute this list. Whatever asynchronous computation that's going on happens in that moment, at the moment when I call foo. So foo is an imperative piece of code. It runs when I call it immediately. But the other foo that returns a flow does not do anything when I call it. It just returns me a flow that just a declaration. It defines the flow, defines the data that will be produced when I need it but it does not run. That's why it doesn't have suspend modifier. It doesn't do anything, it just quickly returns. And to run the flow, I use some terminal operator, collect. So when I call collect, then when it runs, and 
it's easy to figure out which operator on the flow is terminal and which is not, because terminal operators are marked with suspend modifier. Running them would actually run the flow. There are other terminal operators. For example, I can ask to get a list from the flow. And it also suspends, gets me a list, and then I have all the elements in my hand and can work on them. The execution order between working with lists and working with flow is also different. So see, when I work with lists, I take a list of three items and I get them in memory. Then I send them to map operator, and then I perform computation and produce a result. So it's step by step. Each step in pipeline happens one after another when I work with lists. But when I work with flows, it doesn't work this way. I emit A and I act on it. I compute the result. I emit B and I act on it and compute result. I emit C and I act on it immediately. You see, it works in a reactive way. It's the every next stage of the flow pipeline reacts on the values emitted from the previous stage. It doesn't wait until the operation is over, it reacts immediately. So flow is reactive. Flow is useful, reactive primitive that lets me reactively uh, process streams of values. At this point, when I say the word reactive, you might remember that on GVM, which is the primary platform the Kotlin runs on, there are lots of other reactive library. So the two most popular of them are Eric Java, which has been there for ages and uh, kind of opened uh, the innovation in the reactive space on, on GVM. And there is a project reactor from uh, Pivotal Spring Team. Both of those libraries provide primitive to work with reactive streams, and they actually build on the common reactive stream specification so they can interoperate between each other. So I can take a stream of reactive stream from my Java and processes with Project Reactor and vice versa. So it's not surprising that Flow also works with reactive stream specification because it's also about reactive streams of data. How we do it? In reactive streams, a reactive stream is represented by an interface called Publisher. So in Flow, we can convert Publisher to a Flow with sflow extension, or we can convert Flow to Publisher with S Publisher extension. So we can do it both ways, uh, interop between flows and reactive streams. So now the question becomes, why do we even create a flow? You see, if there are so many other reactive streams, what difference does the flow make? You know, I've, I've told you how it's different from channels, how it's different from uh, working with lists, but why didn't we just use you know, RxJava Project Reactor or other implementation of a reactive stream specification. And of course, one answer would be because multi-platform. You know, uh, here in Kotlin Conference, I mean, you hear about multi-platform a lot, but that wouldn't be the right answer because if we just cared about multi-platform, we could have just ported Eric's Java to Kotlin, uh, rewrote it in Kotlin, compiled for uh, Kotlin GS, Kotlin Native, and we got multi-platform implementation of reactive streams. So why didn't we do it? Why we had to do something different. So what's the real difference? Let's take a closer look. Let's take, for example, XJava. What if I have a value and I need to perform a transformation, map it to some other value? In XJava, I have an operator for that called map. And it takes a mapper function that turns one type into another, which is great. But this works only with synchronous mapping functions, the functions that quickly compute result or return. However, if the operation or transformation I want to do is asynchronous, so it has to go over the network, or wait for a result from some service or database or something else, then I have to use a different function called flat map single that works with asynchronous mappings. Now, if I want to filter my data and I have a predicate to filter, then I have a function called filter, but it works only with synchronous predicates. Uh, what if my predicate is asynchronous? What if decision of take it or not depends on the call to some third-party service? Uh, 
you know, who knows what to do? I don't know, go figure. You know, there are hundreds of operators, so figure which one is a synchronous analog to filter. So with flow, it's all different. With flow, if I want to transform my data, I have a single operator called map. And the transformation of this operator is a lambda that's marked with suspend modifier. So it does not care if the code inside is synchronous or asynchronous. It works for both cases. One operator covers both cases. The same for filtering. You know, I have filter predicate, and the lambda task is marked with suspend modifier, which is a unique Kotlin feature. That's why you, know, you can have them this kind of convenience in Air Java Project Reactor, because those are Java libraries, which doesn't have you know, anything like suspension. So they had to duplicate their interfaces for synchronous and asynchronous cases. We don't have to. So this reliance on suspending function in Kotlin, which is cornerstone of Kotlin coroutines, lets us avoid lots of operators. So instead of hundreds of operators, we can have just a few dozens. You see, we don't need a special operator to start our stream with a value. We can just say on start emit value. We don't need to have a special operator to start our stream of data with elements emitted by another flow. We just say on start emit all from this flow. We don't need a special operator to delay uh, the start of the stream by a certain time. We just say on start delay for this time. We don't need a special operator to delay each value of a stream. You know, we just say on each delay for this time. We don't need a whole family of error hanging operators. We don't need an operator of, like on error return. We just say catch and emit value if you caught exception. If you want to catch exception and do something else, just say catch and emit all from some other flow. So we don't need the whole family of generator functions. If you want to produce a flow programmatically, you just say flow and a curly braces write the code that emits the values in the way you want it, them to be emitted. You know, w it's way more composable. Because of reliance on suspending function, we can do more with less operators. We can provide just core basic operators that you can combine in any imaginable combination to produce the data processing pipelines that you need. Or you can define your own operators easily if you use certain combination too often in your particular code. We don't have to have those hundreds and hundreds of operators. So you see, it boils down to the fact that Kotlin suspending functions combined with reactive streams is, is the best thing imaginable on Earth. So it's really the power of Kotlin Suspending function, you know, with and reactive streams concept, it's a really big love between them. They, uh, they do augment each other beautifully, producing simpler, easy API. So we talked, uh, I said about API. So let's see what's it's inside. So, I mean, for now, it's like magic. Some flow, some complicated things is how magically reduces uh, the number of operators we need and doing uh, those beautiful things. So let's uh, take a look under the hood. The flow itself actually turns out a very simple interface. It's just an interface with a single suspending function called collect. There's nothing more. You can go to source, click, and, and I'm not joking, this is exactly what flow is inside. And this collect function takes another interface called flow collector. And if we click on that, we see flow collector, again, simple interface, single suspending function called emit. That's it. That's all the flow design. There's nothing more. Not three, not four, not five interfaces, just two and interfaces to functionalism. Nothing more. It's really, really simple thing. But this simple thing, because it's based on suspending function, produced, produces amazing results. Let's see how it works. So when I collect the flow, um, the, the call actually goes to the other side, to the definition of a flow. That's, for example, defined like this. It's uh, flow, curly braces, and emitting a value. So now the control goes to this block of code in, in, in braces. And this block of code starts running this lambda and calls emit. This emit actually immediately goes to the lambda on the left-hand side. You know, there's just direct function call from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. And, you know, left-hand has gets control, and in our case, it 
prints the value. So the value gets printed, lambda returns back to emitter. If emitter has no other values to emit, it returns, returning control to collector. That's it how it works. There's no magic in between. There are just function calls back and forth between collector and emitter. So if emitter emits two values, it's just one more call from emitter to collector. That's it. Nothing more. But emitter, for example, can delay. It can be asynchronous. It doesn't have to immediately emit. It can wait for something to happen, wait for 100 milliseconds to pass, wait for some event to happen, and then emit, which allows us to have an asynchronous emitting emitter. So we can have asynchronous streams of events that you know, tick every second, you know, wait, produce some events, or something like that. But collector can also be asynchronous. Collector can delay. It can be slow. It can be saving values to database, and it takes time, because that's a synchronous call to database to save the value. And see, while collector is suspended, waiting for something, there's no more emissions. You know, you can call it because it has not returned. So this way we get back pressure support automatically. If our collector is slow, you know, it, it just slows down the emitter that produces the values. And there is no special magic to support it. It just happens automatically because of the nature of suspending function and the fact that these are just function calls back and forth and nothing more. So this simple design not only makes it easier to work with flows because there's simply less moving parts, but because there are less moving parts and flows, they're actually faster. It, simple design leads to performance. We, you've already seen these numbers on uh, the uh, keynote, but let's uh, look at them a little bit more detail. So there is a popular benchmark called Scrabble. It was originally developed by uh, Giuseppe Mord uh, and was later adapted by David Karnak for Java. It's like data streaming. It uses lots of operators, you know, maps, filters, reduce. Uh, it takes big dictionary of, uh, it, it takes Shakespeare plays and uh, figures which words uh, would get how many points in a uh, Scrabble game and figures out which are the, the best words, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's pretty, it has a fair bit amount of code. So, and if you, we've ported, it's been ported for different data streaming um, frameworks and we've ported this benchmark to flows too. Uh, but, as a baseline to see what, how fast you could do this benchmark, we're just running this benchmark on Kalten sequences. Kalten sequences are the primitives that are in Kalten standard library, and they are not asynchronous. They don't support big pressure. It's just simple, like, iterable collections. They have as little overhead as possible. So this number that you can do this benchmark in uh, uh, nine milliseconds tells you kind of baseline. That's how fast you could do if you don't have any overhead for, you know, a synchrony at all. Now if we run this and with Eric Java 2, the same benchmark on the same machine, we see it takes 23 milliseconds. Is that an overhead of managing, you know, all the synchrony in its, uh, and these reactive data flows in a typical reactive framework? And if you look at Project Reactor, it shows very similar numbers, because they are both based on the same uh, reactive stream specifications, and their inherent, uh, their inherent overhead is virtually the same. But if we run this benchmark on flow, what we see is that it just runs in 30 milliseconds. So it's still slow, of course, in sequence. There is some overhead. You know, you can get this asynchrony completely for free, but it's very little overhead. You know, it runs almost twice as fast as Eric's Java and a little bit slower than sequences while giving you way more possibilities. You can have asynchronous data producers, you can have, uh, you know, back pressure. It, it doesn't come for free, but it comes cheaply and without adding overhead or a lot of complexity to your code. So, flow, as I repeated several times, is asynchronous. It's for working with asynchronous data streams. But it's still sequential in nature, and that's a very important thing. Asynchrony does not equal pluralism or concurrency. And synchrony is, is, means that we are working with events that uh, happen after some, we have to wait for them. They don't happen 
synchronous then immediately. There is some network response we're waiting for, button click we're waiting for, and now we are something like that. But flows are sequential. And when I say sequential, it actually translates to the actual running times of our flow pipelines. So if my flow pipeline takes 100 milliseconds to emit each value and 100 milliseconds to decide that there are no more values to be emitted, and my collector also takes 100 milliseconds to process each value, then my whole pipeline, together with collecting and emitting, would take 700 milliseconds. It's all sequential. It's collector and emitting working in tandem completely sequentially. No concurrency happening here, which might be not what we want because, you know, it's not, in some cases, this is not very efficient because now I'm, I could have done it slightly faster. I don't have to, maybe I don't want to wait, uh, you know, uh, for previous event to be processed uh, before I start computing the next one. Fortunately, with flows, uh, it's easy to do. You know, we just need to go from this single coroutine, that's a single sequential uh, steps, to multiple coroutines. How we do it? We have to go concurrent. And going concurrent with, slow, with flow is, doesn't mean we have to write some complicated code. Going concurrent with a flow is easy. We just use special concurrent operators, like buffer. Buffer is a ready-to-use operator in flow that you just insert between emitter of your data and collector. And what it does is that with buffer, while collector as soon as collector has computed the value and gave it uh, to uh, emitter produces the value, gave it to collector, it can immediately start producing the next one. And collector works on previous one in parallel. So you get collector and emitter working in parallel with buffer now at the same time. So the whole duration of the whole data processing pipe and now shortens to 400 milliseconds just by adding buffer operator. Behind the scenes, what happens is that collector now runs in a separate coroutine from the emitter. So you have now a separate coroutine for emitter, separate coroutine for collector, and there is actually a channel behind the scenes that's sending data from emitting coroutine to collecting one. But you then don't have to write any of this code. You don't have to set up this channel. You don't have to make sure it's closed properly. You don't have to do any of that. You just insert an operator. You declare your intent. You say, I want emissions be buffered between this emitter and this collector. And that's all. You don't have to actually write all this code to establish a separate coroutines, channel between them, etc., etc. So it's declarative and safe. You, you, there's no risk you'll forget to clean something up. That's all good, but in many environments, especially when we program UI applications, it's important to understand where the execution happens. You see, uh, modern UI apps are peculiar in that there is a dedicated uh, UI thread, main thread, and there's lots of things like updating UI that we are only allowed to do on this dedicated main thread. It's not that critical in backend application, even though in backend application it also happens. In backend application we can have some dedicated data handling threads that we should not be blocking, et cetera, et cetera. It just happens to a lesser extent in uh, backend uh, than in frontend. So it's so still important to understand. So when I work with this, where all the execution happening, what's the context of execution? So let's take a look at how it relates to flow. So here is my uh, data producer, uh, definition of my flow that computes some values. And here is collector that takes this flow, calls collect. So the question we may ask is, where does this compute execute? What's execution context of this computation? Is it some background thread or something else? And the answer is simple. It's always executing on the same context where I call collector. Because remember, it's just a simple function call. You know, collector and meter, they work in tandem. It just functions calling back and forth. N nothing strange going on here. So the context is always the same. But what if I 
need to adjust this context. What if my collector is on the main thread, which I shouldn't be blocking, but my computation is some intensive CPU work that I cannot be running on my precious main thread? What I do then is I use an operator, this operator called flow on. I say flow on and specify like a dispatcher, like dispatcher default. And this operator affects all the, everything above it and changes execution context for the preceding code. So now the, this code executes in background thread. What's important here, though, even though my computation now in background thread and data is emitted from background thread, the code that I see here still executes in collector's context. The context of my uh, emitter never leaks downstream. And that's, that's an actual huge difference from how other reactive streams you might be working with operate. Uh, in flow, there's, there's never ever upstream flow affecting the context of the downstream. So when I look at this code and my main function, I don't have to know how my foo is implemented. I don't have to read its documentation or its source and to learn what context it interestingly uses. I always know if I'm running the main function on the main thread, then I know the code in this main function is going to be executed on the main thread too. So this is called context preservation, this very important property that uh, all flow operators maintain. This leads us all discussion, this kind of a usage of flow in UIs. So because again, caring about context is a big thing in UI, and uh, of course, uh, flow is a generic concept. It's both the back end and front end. And front end is big, so we have some special convenience things for front ends that are specifically tar target for them. Let's take a look. How do we use flow in a front end? So in a front end, we have events. And flow is a, because flow is a synchronous data stream. We can use it to represent sequences of streams of events in our UI. So we can have some function that returns a flow of events. And in UI, what we do, usually we do, we want to subscribe to those events. So we launch a curtain in our UI scope that gets those events and start collecting them. What do we do with those events? We update some UI, right? So we call, uh, what do we call? Why don't we call anything? Here's it, we call update UI. So, and because, we, because of the context preservation, we don't have to look at the events implementation. We know because we launched this coroutine in UI scope, our update UI is going to be called in UI scope. Everything's great. So this is very common pattern, subscribing to events. And there is a kind of mouthful of code for this really common pattern. Uh, lots of indentation, you know, two, two sets of indented uh, braces. It kind of reminds of the callback hell that uh, we wanted to avoid. So uh, so we have a better way to write it. So instead, we can say, let's take events. On each event, do this, and then launch the whole data pipeline in the scope. So there is a special launching operator that's specifically designed to make writing this kind of code convenient. So, but it's not all that we have to worry about in our UI applications. You know, UI applications, have lots of different lifetimes. You know, we have windows open uh, that are, work for a while and gets closed. And when I close the window or activity or uh, some action, I have to clean everything it was doing. And there are lots of these lifetimes of different durations in a, a typical UI application. So how do we manage those? Let's take a look at traditional approach to managing lifetime. So let's take a look, for example, Eric's Java. So in Eric's Java, uh, the flow, the data stream is represented by observable. And when I subscribe to this observable, I get a thing called subscription. Subscription represents the, the active flow. It's hot thing. You know, it's working now. And because it's working, I, I can't just lose it. You know, if you just call subscribe, forget to do something, with it, that's bad. Because you know, if my activity or whatever I was doing now gets closed, uh, it would still be working in background consumer resources. So what I have to do in practice, um, I have to create some composite disposable. Don't forget to add 
as a result of my subscribe to it. And when I don't need all my uh, subscriptions anymore, I clear my composite. That's a typical pattern I use with uh, reactive trims. But with flows, it works in a different way. So with Kotlin flows, we represent a synchronous data stream as a flow. And then to start subscription, we launch a coroutine. And we launch a coroutine, we get a job. So in job, in this case, is kind of synonym for subscription. But there is one big difference between subscriptions and jobs. You see, jobs always is launched in some coroutine scope. This is the thing that's called structured concurrency. It's never standalone. It's never, it's never on its own. It's always launched in some scope. And because of that, the management of lifetime becomes more convenient. You see, because we have to specify a scope when we launch activity, you know, uh, and the scope where we take it. You know, we, in our UI application, we can have some as main scope for a UI, or we have uh, some utility extensions, like in Android KTX, we can take a, a, a scope of our, of our activity, or fragment, or any other UI entity. So, and then when this UI entity closes, we cancel it, or it gets canceled automatically. And with Flow, we can't forget to provide this scope. You see, there's no way to launch a coroutine with a Flow without specifying a scope. There's no way we could forget specifying it and let our job just working loose there. I mean, this parameter in launching is required. We cannot omit it. We cannot do without it. So it's, it's actually similar if you look at uh, UI-specific uh, ways to represent asynchronous streams like live data. You see that observe method on Android live data actually also has a required parameter for a scope. So it's interesting how Flow being not UI-specific frameworks, uh, because it's both for front-end and back-end, still manages uh, to use those best practices from UI-oriented frameworks is that whenever you start subscribing to data, you have to specify a lifetime in which you do that. What's next? Oh, next is what's next? So that's kind of uh, the, what's the overview of the flow as we currently have it. And we still have a little bit of time to tell you about the status, where we're standing, and what we're planning to do next with the flow. So flow, as I told you at the beginning, is now a stable. It was released in a stable way in Kotlin Coroutines 1.3. So it means stable means all the core APIs and core operators, like filtering, mapping, all the basic things are stable. There are still a bunch of experimental operators that we will be finalizing next releases, and there are some new features coming up. So what are those? In future, first of all, we plan to do more things for UI applications. We plan to provide out-of-the-box supports for different UI models, like representing your state, representing your events. That's, that's going to come. We also will support sharing caching and flows, because you know, flows are cold things. So every time you collect it, it started again. But sometimes you know, producing flow is expensive operation. So you want maybe to share uh, one process computing the values with uh, different collectors. That's what caching and sharing is for. We also plan to provide more operators for concurrency pluralism. So you can do concurrent mapping, you know, and uh, with convenient operators without having to write this code yourself in a declarative fashion. We will also be adding more chunking and window operators, so you can split your flows into chunks, either by time or by size. For example, if you want to periodically save data to database on certain conditions, et cetera, et cetera, that will all be added in one of the next releases. If you have something that's missing, you have some use case that flow does not cover, don't hesitate to give us feedback. So it's an open source project on GitHub come to issues, create issue, explain what's your use case, what you want to do, and we'll either give you a pointer to how you can do it with existing operators, or we'll figure out uh, what new operators we need to provide to make your life easier. If you want to learn more about flows, uh, these are resources I will recommend. First of all, the official Kotlin Lang site has uh, specifically written chapter on flows with lots of examples of how to use them and how they work. Uh, there are API docs 
that lets you depth, uh, dig in depth to all the functions that are there. And you, you can also read uh, plus in my medium. This basically give the same kind of amount of information I give in this talk, but just in more depth and more detail for those who, are, who like to read. So that's it. Thank you very much. And remember to vote for the talk.